Hey everyone, time for some um, discussions, I think, um, here in the United States of America. Um, it's, been, it's been an interesting <clears throat> couple of days. My desk is a mess. Pilates socks. Um, oh, my stepdaughter's playing saxophone, so Lisa Simpson is out here. Bulletproof coffee. Do you hear it? You can hear it, right? Saxophone. Um, any saxophone players out there, go ahead and raise your hands. I am not. Um, I can't even read sheet music. I tried. I was pretty good at piano, um, playing it, feeling it, but I couldn't read the sheet music to save my life. And I have that, I, I realized how dyslexic I was when I saw my son and how dyslexic he is. And, um, I was that person trying to read the sheet music going, every good boy does fine. And trying to find out where the notes are on the, on the page. Disaster. Um, but anyway, we'll let the sax go. It'll be our, um, our, our soundtrack for this uh, video. But I came up with a little phrase and you guys can tell me what you think. Um, so that phrase is, if I can, if I can read my own writing, um, let's see. Americans can't recognize the religiosity of their politics and the ancient Egyptians couldn't recognize the politics in their religiosity. So um, that's, that's a, um, an interesting statement. And um, in the context of authoritarianism and authoritarian personalities, um, even democratic states that verge onto authoritarianism, this is the context of the class I'm teaching now through an ideological religious lens. I think of symbols of that authoritarianism that make it good, right? It's not whether or not authoritarianism is good or not. That's, um, that's something that we can all decide for ourselves. That conversation is happening. Uh, whether or not you want to live in a more equitably distributed society for power or money, or whether you want to live in a society that's very top-down and very hierarchical, some people feel safer in a hierarchical society. That's a different discussion, an important one to have. But, um, but what I'm interested in talking about now is the, are the optics, the perspective, the appearance of goodness of that authoritarian society. And so, I, you know, I don't remember who suggested it, but one of you suggested to me that I get this book, Blood and Sacrifice and the Nation, or Blood, Sacrifice and the Nation, apologies, um, Carolyn Marvin and David Ingle. And it's all about um, totemics, um, the totem, the, the, the United States flag, and how it is thought of as um, this uh, device that proves to us our individuality, our freedom, what we fight for, what we die for. And it is such a totem that if you don't stand with your hand on your heart during the national anthem, but instead kneel in protest of something or hold your hand up in a black fist, um, then you are considered outside the bounds of goodness. You are considered immoral. You are considered something that is not um, meant to be a part of our society and you're excluded, you're not paid, you're punished, something happens to you, right? In ancient Egypt, the symbols are more complicated. Um, things like crowns, staffs, um, there are rituals, there are rituals of, of giving and offering, there's a ritual of, of worshiping, um, ritual movements, um, there's certain burial rites, there's sounds. There, I mean, these things that can be totemized, that can be um, uh, fetishized, these things that can be um, the golden calf, as my husband Remy said um, yesterday. He's like, oh yeah, we all make our golden calves. We take these things and we turn them into something that um, becomes the, the good thing rather than, than being good at all. And I think of this, uh, this flag in the United States or this crown of the ancient Egyptian king, which is going to fill some people with ease and, and belonging when they see it, um, a pride. And for others, it is going to induce extraordinary fear and panic. I was talking to um, one of my students in this class on authoritarianism and she wrote me and said that whenever she sees a, a MAGA hat, a Make America Great Again hat, it makes her heart race and she gets super nervous because she feels like she is under threat. 
in some way. And for her, seeing that hat is akin to seeing a, a Confederate flag on a truck or another symbol of um, a certain kind of power. And it's, um, but then that hat for others is enough to make you go on the crusade, go into the state capitol building, bring your weapon and show your power, right? So it's something that can, uh, that can encourage you to, to even in your own mind, take your own life into your own hands um, and go on literally a crusade, um, fighting for something that you believe in. So it's pride for some, fear and aversions for others, but these symbols, they are so charged and they represent to me the key of the authoritarian state and the reason it works so well. The authoritarian states that succeed for more than a generation, for long periods of time that aren't swept aside are those that key in the best, and the ancient Egyptians did this so well, that key in the best to morality, to the battle of good versus evil, light against the darkness trying to, to remove those who are doing ill for society and, and only hold to the, the good and, and the pure. So you can think of it as who's American and who's not, who's Egyptian and who's not. Um, even Akhenaten's radicalism of the 18th dynasty finds a place in, in this uh, discussion. He's doing what is good for, for his people and for... Um, maybe just for himself, but he's, he's fighting for the light, literally, for the, the sun disk, for the autumn. The Egyptians have a word for this, which is a word that people have spilled so much ink over and written about so uncritically and so unpolitically, apolitically even, and that word in Egyptian is ma'at, and it means truth, justice, order, and you see the king offering the symbol of Maat to a god and the god giving him millions of years of reign. The, the king with his authoritarian power is the one who gives the good and just order. He is set up as the chief priest, but he's set up as the one who creates the law and order for the people underneath him. And Jan Asman, the brilliant Egyptologist, German Egyptologist in Heidelberg, has written a whole volume, extensive volume on Ma'at, without much of a critical gaze to how it serves the top 1% and how it serves the authoritarianism at the top. That this, this law and order is our uh, reward for giving up our freedom and individuality for this particular kind of state. So it's an interesting way of looking at, at the authoritarian regime so, or personality. If they key into ideologically, religiously, into this idea of good versus evil, then they will have a base and they will have people on their side. They will have a populism um, and they will have a, a platform of demagoguery uh, to, to stand upon. Um, the, you know, you end up, when you do this, now here's another cool thing that I was talking about with my class. When you, this is how powerful it is. If you make this a discussion of good versus evil and the people who don't hold their hands over the flag are, are um, wrong and bad, they are now not participating in the good morality of your state and they are treated as such. They are excluded, they are ostracized, they are punished. Um, in some cases, as we know from the last um, couple of days, they can even uh, be killed. So the, this non-participation um, in these ideological rights, encourage the oppressed to find power to move into the realm of the oppressor and to take on some of these symbols for themselves. This brings up the idea of the, the minority that participates, um, the very uh, provocative phrase, the model minority, and that to get any kind of power to bring back to your community, you have to enter into the belly of the beast, enter into the place where you not, you're not allowed or you're considered immoral. Dress the part, talk the part, give up your culture as was, move into the culture that, that has power over you, and then take all of the totems and symbols of that culture and then use them to serve your people. But when you do so, you have the very <laughs> serious problem of forgetting who you were to begin with. So if you're a native Mexican American, can you speak your native language anymore? Is it all about Spanish and, and do you dress in your native ways? Almost certainly not. Um, if you're a woman, 
and you have to enter into the halls of power. You have to lower your voice. Um, look at how low Hillary Clinton's voice got between part one and part two of her race for the president. You have to dress in your pantsuit. You have to make sure you got those blocky heels on, not too much makeup, but don't show any gray hair. You know, it has to be a certain kind of masculinization. When you, as a woman, and I see this all the time, those women that fight so hard in the patriarchal bro world to get to that CEO position, to get to the top, how much of themselves do they lose along the way? How many compromises? How many transactional, um, uh, how, how many transactions have they made to get to that point? And how, how much can they give back to their sisterhood when they get to the inside of that? Um, I think that's something that many women in power will understand in their gut and uh, may make them feel a little nervous and upset whether they want to or not. Um, but that's how powerful this ideology of the authoritarian regime is that functions because it's about the battle for the light. That is the, that is, those are the optics. That is how it is presented. So that, as I discussed last time, the 25th dynasty king Pianke, or soon to be Egyptian king, He's had his ancestors strung up on the bows of ships by Egyptian kings before. But when he moves into Egypt as a conquering hero king to reunify the Egyptian state, he is going to be more pious than ever. He is going to determine that those Libyan feather wearers who have eaten fish are not pure enough to enter the temple. And he will, he will bar them with his um, devout respect of the Egyptian totems, the Egyptian symbols, the Egyptian ideology of good versus evil in the authoritarian optics. Um, it's interesting that as we cleave, we with authoritarian personalities in the United States or in the ancient world or around the world, as more and more people find a safety in authoritarianism, those symbols that can stand for freedom and individualism are actually the opposite in their functionality. And the way they work is to, to, to actually um, tamp down on those things. But so instead of freedom, well, somebody would say, here's the way I see the flag and we could look at it for the Egyptian crown in the same way. The American flag, it's that symbol of freedom, right? And somebody who, is who believes in the ideology of that flag without criticism, without self-reflection or reflection of any kind, would look at it and say, no, it represents freedom. And without freedom, you have anarchy. So we must have this. We must respect this flag. We cannot have anarchy. We need the rule of law. Um, there will be no borders if we don't have this flag. We must have the nationalism. And so there is this f absolute fear that if we abandon the symbol, we abandon the rule of law, and thus we have the anarchy and the lack of borders, and we all go to hell in a handbasket and everything's horrible. Um, it works for all kinds of things. It represents so much more. So this American individualism, if you say, um, you know, we're not socialists, right? We don't give money hardly at all in, in any kind of welfare system. Um, there's a right to work states um, for labor unions and other things. I mean, there's very little equitable distribution of, of resources in the United States. And so the ideology of the American individualism then supports, well, if we actually equitably distributed things more, then, you know, the, those people didn't work for it. You know, they, they don't, they, they shouldn't have it. I worked hard for this and they did not. So the ideology of um, the flag and the nationalism and the symbolism of the battle for what is right actually supports taking welfare away from people and not um, redistributing in any kind of way and even lowering taxes so much that you can't pay for public education as you see in states like Oklahoma, Missouri, other places. And those of you that live in those states can chime in and let me know what you think. Um, I mean, in the end, and I, I've, I've said a lot and it's been very abstract, um, but what I'll, I'll say is that the things that are missing when we buy into the optics of the authoritarian regime, buy into the ideology, buy into the idea that there is something that's right, that we know what the right thing is and that the other people are wrong and that they need to be controlled, they need to have a knee on their neck, then what we end up abandoning in favor of the totem, in favor of the, the optics of the good king, 
is any sort of human kindness in favor of keeping the borders, keeping the rule of law, there is, um, we abandon this local protection of the people around us. We abandon um, looking after our neighbors and our friends to, to help them out. And we, we abandon our local news, we abandon our local governments, we abandon um, working to protect any sort of community because when you're fighting for what is right and good in this individualistic flag-driven totemic society, then every it's always each man for himself and you have people prepping and you have people um, with guns in their homes and you have people taking the rule of law into their own hands and it becomes a zero-sum game in people's minds and kindness is very much abandoned and it's interesting that kindness itself is laughed at and people are called snowflakes and people are um, if you bring up something as simple as human kindness then people are naive um, what would you do if somebody came into your house with a gun? Why would you not protect yourself? That kind of argument is made. Um, and I will, <laughs> um, at the risk of being called a naive snowflake liptard, these words are, are thrown around a lot, um, err again and again in favor of kindness. This is what I think some states can actually move towards. I think it is possible to try to create a social system, a complex social system in which community, kindness through community is something that we can support rather than power and walls and borders and control and the, the path, the right path to the light. And whenever anyone tells me, well, this is the right thing to do, I go, I'm like, well, how do you know that? Are you sure what's going on? When you see people holding so fast and tight to something on the right or the left, about they know what is right, then as the Buddhists say, when you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> Which means as soon as you know that that's the Buddha, you, you, don't act, you must kill it in your mind. You don't actually know what, what the Buddha is. And states do this to us all the time. They veil their real intents with all of the ideology, with the religiosity that you and I in the United States can't even see because the we have this, you know, no church and state together and we separate the two. But I will um, hold to that at the end and read you my what I wrote down again and you guys can tell me if you agree or disagree. And I'll add the word authoritarian to it this time and you can, you can tell me what you think that Americans can't recognize the authoritarian religiosity of their politics, and that ancient Egyptians could not recognize the authoritarian politics of their religion. So, um, as we are all thinking around the world, and particularly in the United States, as we look at the system that we have built and that it seems we deserve, um, let's think of what we can do to move towards something that is um, kinder. Thank you, guys.